Okay, in this video I'm going to continue on with my tutorials on quantum statistics. This is video number 53 and in the subsection of applications of quantum statistics this is video number 11. So I'm going to discuss the Sommerfeld expansion. I'd like to draw your attention to my website universityphysicstutorials.com. So recently I've done a lot of videos or what I'd like to think is a reasonably comprehensive uh, you know, set of tutorials on quantum statistics. But in the past, I had also made videos on a lot of the topics which I've done in this section of applications of quantum statistics. So for that reason, I now have a few duplicates. Now my duplicates, they're all kind of, they're all standalone videos. And I think that it's worth, I'm not going to take them down, I'm actually going to link them all together. And the reason I'm going to do that is because some have extra information or a different slant uh, than, than others. So this particular video on the Summerfield expansion, I've done one of these before. And I'm going to call it, it, the video, the duplicate video is called number 33D. So I'm going to call this particular video part 1 of 2 on the Summerfell expansion. And number 2 of 2 is 33D. I've put all my duplicate videos as uh, 33B, C and D. Now in order to understand what's happening in this video, you need to look at number 52, where I did a Taylor expansion of epsilon to the 3 over 2, centered around epsilon is equal to the mechanical potential or the energy, would say, is equal to chemical potential. I have a set of duplicate videos here. Number 33A is the video I made recently. The duplicate of this is 33B, and this is on the Fermi level, and calculating the density of states in terms of the Fermi level. And number 24 is also, sorry, excuse me, number 33C is a duplicate of 24 on the density of states, full stop. So I think you should look at all those. They're, they might be interesting. You, you might get some piece of information from the duplicate that you didn't get, we'll say, from my more recent video. So we need to ask ourselves, what is the Sommerfeld expansion all about? Well, what we're trying to do is we're trying to calculate the chemical potential mu and the total energy U in, uh, uh, due to the electrons in a Fermi gas. Okay, a degenerate Fermi gas. Degenerate, by the way, means that the occupancy, occupancy is equal to uh, 1. We'll say we're, right, we're at temperature T is equal to 0, I suppose. So the occupancy is equal to 1 up to the, up to the Fermi level. But I don't, I don't want to really go there. So what we're trying to do is calculate the chemical potential and the total energy due to electrons in a Fermi gas. Now where is this applicable? If you're looking about electrons in a metal, or in a solid, we'll say, you're, you're analysing the thing, the whole system, as a Fermi gas. Now it may not have been said to you like that in your lectures, but that's what you're looking at. So this Summerfield expansion works for that also. Okay, so how do we calculate Oh, excuse me, why is it called the Sommerfeld expansion? The reason is because, as we'll see in a moment, the integrals we need in order to calculate mu and u are quite complicated. So Sommerfeld, who was a German, he uh, basically used a Taylor expansion of epsilon to the 3, or the energy to the power of 3 over 2. When you plug it into the integral, it made life a lot easier, and as a result, it's called the Sommerfeld expansion. And by the way, uh, Sommerfeld, as far as I'm aware, he was the supervisor of Bloch, who uh, came up with the block functions, and I've um, I've been told, for example, that Sommerfeld had uh, a big hand in cac in the block functions, and perhaps he actually knew that they were possible, or he knew what they're all about before he ever got Block to start doing them during his PhD. But that's beside the point. I suppose that's that's getting on a tangent. So let's start. Now I was hoping to do this uh, via a sheet of paper, we'll say, and just put put it online. But I'm going to have to go through this, and it can be perhaps slightly tedious. So, we're going to start as follows. If you're going to calculate the total number of particles, in this case electrons, or fermions in general, in anything, in a Fermi gas or in a metal, we're going to need to, calculate, we're going to, need to integrate the, the, um, the number density with respect to energy, or the equivalent integral is integrating the density of states, we'll say if it's um, as a function of energy, then we're going to have the occupancy function. And we integrate that dE. So, the... Uh, We'll say the density of states. How do we calculate the density of states? Well, I've done that in a previous video. And the density of states is going to be 3n over twice e Fermi to the 3 over 2 square root epsilon. I'm sure you'll have seen that, okay? So that's on my video of, uh, of calculating the, the Fermi level in terms of the, uh, or the density, calculating the Fermi level and then calculating the density of states in terms of the Fermi level. So I'm going to make a substitution or kind of a placeholder. I'm going to call g sub 0 
uh, I'm going to call that twice n, or 3n, excuse me, over twice e Fermi to the 3 over 2. Now, e Fermi is a constant at a particular temperature, so it, at t is equal to 0, we'll call it that it's, it's a constant. Don't get bogged down and saying 0, 0 Kelvin is impossible, and then your integrals blow up. We'll just assume that it, it go, it's in the limit as t approaches 0. Okay? So if I also make, so sorry, we next know that the occupancy function for the uh, the Fermi Dirac occupancy function is going to be 1 over e to the epsilon minus mu beta, where beta is 1 over kt, or the thermodynamic beta is equal to 1. So I'm going to make the substitution that we're just going to have e to the x plus 1. I'm sure you've seen that in my previous videos where we define x is equal to epsilon minus mu over kt. 1 over kt is the thermodynamic beta. Okay, so we're just going to do this integral and calculate the total number of particles in our Fermi gas or in our metal. Turns out not to be as straightforward. Well, it's, it's straightforward, but you just, you just need to be careful. So when you plug them in, you can just believe me at this part at the very least. The integral is, is as follows. We're going to get square root epsilon d epsilon divided by e to the x plus 1. Now, how do you do this? Well, we integrate it by parts. So, like, for example, we assume that we can bring e to the x plus 1. We can assume that we can do that, okay? So, we're going to integrate by parts. How do we integrate by parts? Well, look, I don't really want to insult your intelligence, but I will remind you, anyway, that it's, uh, it's the following, okay? So, that means we need to get... Now, the way I like to write it, I don't know if this makes any sense to you. I kind of... I like to do it this way. So, if you u prime, v prime, and v. So, I'll let you do the integrals. Like, for example, when you get d d epsilon of this, actually, I'll just give you the answer, because we're going to need a d d epsilon of um, 1 over e to the, uh, what was it? e to the epsilon minus mu beta plus 1. If you do this nice and carefully, look, I'm sure you can do it. There's no problem there. You're going to get minus 1 over kt, you're going to get e to the x, and you're going to divide by e to the x plus 1 to be squared. Alright? That's where I've plugged in x again, just to make it look a bit easier. So, I'm sure if you're at the level of looking at the Summerfield expansion, you can do a bit of a derivative like that. So, that means we have 1 over, where we define u as 1 over e to the x plus 1. That means u prime, as I said a moment ago, was minus 1 over kt e to the x over uh, let's say e to the x plus 1 all to be squared like that then we're going to be prime is square root epsilon and this time we're going to get v as 2 thirds epsilon to the 3 over 2 look epsilon to the 3 over 2 I said that Sommerfeld did an expansion a Taylor expansion uh, about up for that so we can see where it's coming from so here's my table for my integration by parts now, what I want to do, first of all, is just look at the term UV. Okay, and this, what I'm about to do here will hold for, for later integrals as well. So UV is going to be 2 thirds G0, and we're going to have E, or we'll say epsilon, how do I do this? Epsilon to 3 over 2 times F of epsilon. If I'm just going to write it like this way, it's just the easiest way of doing it. Now, it's going to be 2 times g0 over 3. We're going to get, we'll say, I know this makes no sense, the mathematicians would hate me for doing this, but I'm going to do it anyway. So we're going to get an infinity to the 3 over 2, and we're going to get 1 over e to the infinity plus 1. We're going to get uh, minus 0, 1 over e to the 0 plus 1. The answer there is 0. Um, because the reason this goes to zero is because e to the infinity will say dominates versus just this infinity term, so it just goes to zero. Now the point here is that the uv term is, is zero, and it will be for all the other integrals we do for for the same reason. So the uv term is zero, so that means my integration by parts just becomes the integral of minus v u prime. So let's do the integral of minus v u prime. So it's minus v u prime like that. So this time it's going to be plus 2 times g0 over 3 times kt. Then we're going to have our integral from 0 to infinity. And we're going to have epsilon to the 3 over 2, 
we want to have e to the x dx sorry d epsilon I'll speak about that in a moment and we're going to have e to the x plus 1 squared now we need to make a change of variables of course because I know I've plugged in x to make things easier but we're going to integrate with respect to x so we know that x is equal to epsilon minus mu over kt so that means dx is equal to del x del epsilon d epsilon and if you do that you're going to find that uh, kt times dx is equal to d epsilon so you plug that in and then we can start do our integral with respect to uh, epsilon or excuse me with respect to x alright now um, the next thing we need or will I, will I plug in the answer so we're going to have the same constants okay we're going to have minus this time we're going to have minus uh, sorry we're not going to have minus plus 2 times g0 over 3 times kt we're going to have another factor of kt here of course that's going to cancel out um, is that right? Three, yeah that's correct we're going to have our integral we're going to have uh, excuse me you know what I'm going to do I'm just going to write it in a different way I'm just going to I'm going to skip ahead because I'm trying to follow my notes here and I'm after getting just confused between two lines but what Sommerfeld did here was he looked at this and he said this epsilon of the 3 over 2 term is going to be a big pain in the face so what he did was a Taylor expansion around um, uh, epsilon of the 3 over 2 around, around mu so in video 52 I did that and the answer to it is that T for epsilon to the 3 over 2 around epsilon is equal to the chemical potential is going to be the chemical potential of 3 over 2 plus 3 over 2 x times kt and there's going to also be a factor of mu to the half here and then you're going to have plus 3 over 8 x times kt to be squared and mu to the minus a half and this goes off obviously to infinity so what we're going to do is we're going to plug this in and as a result we're, we're clearly going to get three different terms in our integral or three different integrals so if you plug all those together and exchange epsilon for x what you're going to get is you're going to get plus 2 times g0 over 3 we're going to get this time the limits are going to have to change from e to mu over kt just when you have a look at your, your, your limits we're going to have e to the x we're going to have e to the x plus 1 and that's going to be squared of course and then we're going to have our Taylor term so it's going to be mu to the 3 over 2 we're going to have plus 3 over 2 times x kt mu to the uh, mu to the half and we're going to have plus 3 eighths x times kt to be squared and we're going to have mu to the minus half obviously going off to infinity we're only going to look at the first three terms and that is the Sommerfeld expansion so then what Sommerfeld did was he looked at the three different integrals so we have we'll say this term here multiplied by mu to the 3 over 2 this part here and this part here now before we go ahead and evaluate each of these integrals I want you to look at this here and we're going to make an assumption which the mathematicians wouldn't like again but this is physics I suppose so oftentimes we're not we're not perfect okay so I, that mu to the minus or minus mu over kt is small so let's just extend it to negative infinity why? well because any of the contributions that uh, any any contributions past minus mu over kt are going to be negligible anyway so what I'm going to do is I'm going to integrate this term then I'm going to integrate uh, this term and this term and then finally I'm going to integrate this term and this term separately and put them all together and that will be our Sommerfeld expansion I'm sure you'll see that it, it's, it can be quite tedious so where do we go from here? well let's put in the first term so the first term of those is going to be twice we'll say two, well, two thirds uh, g0 we're going to have a factor of mu to the 3 over 2 and we're going to have our infinite integral like that and this time we're going to have e to the x dx over e to the x plus 1 to be squared alright 
So it's actually, believe it or not, easier if you change back into into epsilon. Like it's kind of it's kind of a silly thing. Well, wh well why did you ever bother changing into x? Uh, I change into x because for later integrals, x is, ha is is easier way to do it. But it turns out for this that we need to go back and we need to say that x is equal to epsilon minus mu over kt, or dx is equal to d epsilon over kt. And you'll see why I'm doing that. So that means that we're going to have two thirds g0 mu to the 3 over 2. Uh, we're going to have minus kt. We're going to have 1 over kt. And we're going to have our integral. So we're going to have du, d epsilon, d epsilon. And you might say, well, hold on a second, where did you get that? Well, the reason I got that is by looking at the following. If we look at u prime, that's going to be equal to minus 1 over kt times e to the x over uh, e to the x plus 1 to be squared. Okay? Because, of course, u is equal to 1 over e to the x plus 1. So for that reason, what we actually have is the derivative of, the, excuse me, the derivative of u. So when you plug them in, of course, the, we can cancel them out and we just get the integral of u, which is pretty straightforward. So we're just going to get the integral of u. So we have all these constants. I'm just going to call these constants alpha. All right. So we're just going to end up alpha multiplied by uh, u, which is 1 over e to the x plus 1. Uh, you're probably at this stage probably you're you're probably annoyed at the fact that I'm keep going between x and uh, and e epsilon, but I'm sure you can understand what I'm doing. So look, when you plug those in, the answer you're going to get is alpha times minus one, which is equal to minus alpha. Okay, and the answer is then therefore the integral becomes uh, plus two thirds g zero mu to the three over two. Um, minus alpha, correct, because it was a minus term up here. Okay, so this is our first integral. That's the first term in our in our Sommerfeld expansion integral. Okay, I'm sure you can you can see it's reasonably straightforward. Just reasonably, not very, but reasonably straightforward. In the next one, we had a load of constants which are not going to bother writing. But if you look at the integral, we had the integral of x to the power of one. We'll say e to the x dx over e to the x plus 1 uh, and there was a square there as well. This is an odd function of x. This there is an odd function of x. And you should know at this stage that if you integrate odd functions you're always going to get 0. So there is no contribution from the middle term. Full stop. So if you calculate the first term, this, the second term is an odd function of x therefore we have no contribution once we integrate it. Now we need to calculate the third term. So the third term is 2 thirds, once again, g0. We're going to have 3 eighths, uh, kt to be squared, mu to the minus half, and we're going to integrate the infinite integral, x squared e to the x over 1 plus uh, e to the x squared. OK. So, uh, what do we do from here? Well, what we need to do from here is note that this, in actual fact, is a Gaussian integral. And you can look it up, you can look it up in the books. I still haven't done videos on Gaussian integrals. I probably will in the, in the future. So this integral here is pi squared over 3. Okay, so when you plug it in, the answer you're going to get, and you do a bit of cancellation of your terms, you're going to get g0 kt to be squared, pi squared, and we're going to get a factor of 12 root pi, or excuse me, 12 root mu, and the bottom. And that's going to be the third part of our integral. So, what was the point of doing all that? I'd say you're bored, maybe you're not even watching, I don't know. But what it means is this, is that we went back to n, we're trying to calculate n. n turned out to have three in independent integrals. We calculated them, so putting them together we get that the first one was two-thirds g0 mu to the 3 over 2. The third one was 0, and then the, uh, sorry, the second one was 0, and the third one was g0 kt times pi to be squared, divided by the 12 times the square root of mu. All right?
right? Remember, of course, that G0 is 3 times n over twice e Fermi to the 3 over 2. Now, you can rewrite this if you like. Let's just plug in all the constants, namely G0, and you're going to get n mu to the 3 over 2, e Fermi to the 3 over 2. We're going to have to add, add to that 1 eighth n k t times pi squared divided by the square root of mu and we have this factor of e fermi to the 3 over 2. And that's really where we're trying to get. We now have a formula for the total number of particles. But look, if you look through it, or if you look at it, you can see that this common factor of the number of particles. So we're now able to get if a, the relationship between the chemical potential and the Fermi energy because we can just cancel out all our ends and we get the following. So now we have a relationship between the chemical potential and the Fermi energy. So another way of looking at this is, is as follows. You can say that, let's just look at, look at here. That means that the ratio of the chemical potential and the, uh, the Fermi energy is approximately 1. Okay, that's what that says. But it's got this correction term, 1 eighth kt times pi to be squared over root nu epsilon or e fermi to the 3 over 2. So the ratio is almost 1, it's got this correction term. So if it's a correction term we can assume, or I suppose let's assume that the correction term the correction term is small. Okay? The correction term is small. So what happens? Well, if the correction term is small, we can assume that in this correction term, mu is approximately e fermi. So we have e fermi here, we have mu, so we can assume that they're both the same thing. So what we're going to do is assume that both of them are the, are the fermi energy. So plug that in and rearrange, and what you're going to get is 1 minus 1 over 8 kt pi to be squared divided by 8 e fermi um, one second, 8 e fermi squared this whole thing here is the two thirds it's going to be equal to mu over e fermi so now we have a ratio of mu versus e fermi now next a small bit of another Taylor expansion that in certain circumstances the Taylor expansion of 1 plus or minus x to something small is approximately 1 plus or minus x multiplied by something small. So if you look at this case we have the power is 2 thirds. The power is pretty small for that reason we can bring the power inside. So we're going to have this 2 thirds here like that. Okay? And that will give us the final form that the ratio of the chemical pot potential to the Fermi energy is given by 1 minus pi squared over 12 kt over e fermi squared okay and that's it okay and just to, to graph it it looks something like this if you graph it it does it does this if you plot kt over e fermi versus u over e fermi so that's the summer fill expansion. So now we're after calculating the chemical potential in terms of the Fermi energy, because of course we can just rearrange like this. And we're now after calculating the function form of the chemical potential for a Fermi gas. So, thanks for watching. Please pass it on to your friends, subscribe to my channel, and you might also click on universityphysicstutorials.com.